Hello, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This is David Moore of Equity Advantage and IRA Advantage. And today's webinar is on five ways your retirement account can be used as the bridge to your future. So uh, first thing, a little uh, housekeeping, if you are a real estate broker looking for CE, especially in Oregon, uh, please let us know, forward your, your brokerage information, and we'll make sure to get you CE uh, certificates issued. If you are a real estate professional in another state and you would like CE, please uh, contact us and we'll uh, reach out to state, see what requirements are needed to give you the CE that you've earned as well. But I always like to say here at the Advantage Companies, that we, we provide little nuggets of knowledge. So if you get out of this presentation in the next hour, hopefully you'll have a few different nuggets of knowledge, but uh, you know, if you get one, hopefully it's worth your time. And I just also, we, we need to talk about, since Equity Advantage is a 1031 exchange company, we need to talk about what's happened with the extensions of section 1031 as well. So without further ado, once again, five ways your retirement account can be used as a bridge to your future. And uh, here we go. So yay, an exchange extension for 1031s. We were finally issued an extension. Notice 2020-23 uh, provided extensions for people that were affected by the coronavirus and, and we've got a date range of transactions that it applies to. So here's a few practice tips for you, extension practice tips. Uh, number one, I wanna say it's an optional extension. So you're not mandated to take it. And then what's really important for people in that scenario is, is to understand is that uh, if we go back to the exchange world 15, 20 years ago, if somebody wanted to terminate a transaction, we'd just give them their money and figure, hey, the government would be happy to receive that tax revenue. Well, probably the early 2000s, we got some guidance and the federal government mandated that uh, anybody that, that does not follow what's called the 1031 G6 rules uh, would have not only the exchange invalidated, but that company's procedures would be invalidated. So anybody that handles exchanges for a living these days is not going to allow money uh, to be received by a taxpayer outside what's called the 1031 G6 rules, which in a nutshell say you cannot receive the money until you've received all property you have the right to. And how that is impacted by this extension and why it's really important that it's, it's considered optional is, imagine if your 45 days does get an extension due to this, due to this uh, situation and you didn't want that extension. So you wanna get your money out and uh, you know, you're impacted by this thing, well, you still have the right to do it. If your 45 days has passed, it doesn't automatically get extended to that July uh, 15th date. So another scenario might apply to you if an exchange's 45 day ID period is extended July 15th, the 180th day is not also extended beyond the initial timelines. Uh, we've got if an exchanger's 180th day deadline is extended extended to July 15th, the initial 45 day ID period is not impacted. Uh, the exchanger must close on ID property to complete the transaction. And then, you know, finally, if an exchanger is not impacted, if their 45 and 180 day deadline falls before April 1st or after July 15th, you would not be receiving any extensions there. If you've got questions, further questions on this, please don't hesitate to reach out and we are getting information out as, as fast as we receive it. But like I said, we are looking for further clarification and the industry, especially the Federation Exchange Condimators is reaching and trying to get more information out there. Um, I'm gonna interrupt this one second. I've got some people in here to help me. I need a battery charger, so my power plug. I'm gonna run out of juice before this thing's over and I don't want that to happen. So. so. Here we go. And um, so, you know, we, we've been through this before. And, and like the old saying goes, deja vu all over again. And, and you know, we've got articles. Our, our company's background goes back to the mid 80s, the exchange company. And, you know, so we had articles written from that company. Uh, Equity Advantage was started in 91, but we've got stuff from the early 80s actually talking about recessions and, and what happens in those scenarios. So we've, we've actually gone through this thing a few different times and it's really sort of entertaining to me because when we go into a time like we're in, 
I'll pull out some of our old recession investing articles, start putting them out. And, and when we were in that 06, 07 period, I actually uh, gave a presentation on recession investing and uh, put that information out. I actually had people in the audience mad at me that we were, that I was implying we're going into a recess, recessionary period. So I actually went back and said, well, hypothetically speaking, if this were to happen, this is what we look at. And I think we're sort of in the same situation now. We, we don't know what's going to happen uh, going forward with this economy and with recovery. But I think it's fair to put out there that we are looking at you know, working on recession investing. So typically when we look at a slowdown, you know, what are the characteristics of recession? Cash is king. Uh, loans are hard to find. Salary increases are smaller. Businesses will not expand to fill vacant space. You know, it's a buyer's market. But, you know, the other thing, I, I guess the first thing that we're seeing, so, you know, we, we talked about extensions in 1031, but the biggest impact we're seeing right now is, is you know, we, we had a situation where the Fed drops interest rates by a point and a half, and all of a sudden our borrowing rates have gone up two points. That's, you know, that's problematic, obviously, but the biggest issue we've got in the exchange world right now is that now there's all these requirements on certain loans where you might have to impound uh, you know, a year's principal payments. And how do you do that? If you don't have money in a bank account someplace else, you wanna use exchange funds to do that, you're gonna have a problem. That, that money typically is gonna be looked at as, as taxable boot. And uh, you know, so, so it's one of those things where we're working forward, trying to figure out exactly how best to do it. Our sort of practice tip on that scenario is if you've got a situation where you're trying to work forward, you have that impound occur, the money comes out. Uh, you know, our, our position is, you know, hopefully the IRS is reasonable in this, but you're gonna talk to your tax people sometime before April 15th, right? Don't do it the 14th. Make sure you got it going on earlier, but you want to let them know what's going on. And, and if you, if when that money is released in the future, that impound, if you put it back into the property, you know, with a, with a, you know, a equity increase, a, a debt pay down, then at least you're in the spirit of what's happened there. And, and we can only hope that the federal government's going to acknowledge your effort and not punish you for it. But that's our probably our biggest problem right now with things slowing down. And that's one of those issues that this presentation is all about. You know, if we got to get a deal done, how do we get it done? What else do we have out there? What have we been told over and over again we can't use? And yet we can. So that's why we come back to that title and, you know, how we're, we're going to use our retirement account to move forward. And uh, unlike a decade ago, you know, a little over a decade ago, now, now we've got with IRA Advantage, we've got experience working through these times and we've got actual you know, case studies that we've done and things that we did previously that we know work and we can use going forward. So hopefully you're gonna get some real benefit out of this and uh, you know, with, with adversity comes opportunity. So you've just gotta look at those situations and what you're gonna do moving forward give yourself a place to go. And, uh, you know, we, we joke on our recession investing information. It says, you know, some brokers just uh, go move to Hawaii until the recession's over, come back in. But like I said, anytime we've got changes, we've got opportunities. So you've got to look at what's going on and, you know, keep in mind cash is king. So if you don't have the cash in the bank, what's another source of cash? Maybe it's, maybe it is your retirement account. So we uh, hope, uh, we're, we're going to give you some good solutions that are going to take care of uh, you. And uh, if you're a professional in this in the real estate field, maybe uh, your client situations too. But, you know, like I always say in presentations, the only dumb question is the one that's not asked. So if you've got questions, uh, we will be addressing some of them at the end of this presentation. But if you've got a situation that you want to you know, go over, I think the best way to do it, uh, you know, the millennials love to text things and love to, you know, hide behind a, a cursor. But the bottom line is, if you give us a phone call, it's very easy to get to the bottom line on something quickly. And we can go back and forth all day with texts and emails and not get to the, the, the root of the issue.
So why real estate? And, and I always joke, I'm, I'm in the business selling real estate to real estate professionals so often. And I, I just, I'm a real estate guy. I love real estate. And, and you know, honestly, I'm not a huge fan, even though we work with uh, retirement accounts and that's one of our businesses with IRA Advantage. I'm not a huge fan of them because I feel like you get money in there in a, in a and I hate the word traditional, but in a traditional IRA sense or 401k sense, you know, what are your investment options? And it's pretty much Wall Street. And if you look at diversification, anytime you look at diversification, any investment advisor is going to say diversify is good. You, you want to diversify diversify your, your investments just for safety purposes. Well, you know, what percent of retirement accounts do you think is in real estate? No, well, it's it's 2% or less. So does that sound like diversification? I don't really think so. And of that 2%, a lot of that is REITs, real estate investment trusts. So when we talk about buying real estate, you know, it's something that I really uh, you know, want to stress. We're, we're talking about buying real estate that gives you the you know, benefits and burdens of owning real estate, which you know, on this slide, we can see you've got cash flow, leverage, interest deductions, mortgage pay down, depreciation, appreciation. You know, the bottom line is a property does not have to go up in value to give you a return. You know, even if you got go buy gold, let's say, and, and you know, what is gold? What's real estate for that matter? I mean, anytime we're looking at anything that is not sold on Wall Street is considered an alternative investment. I, I don't really call them alternative investments. And I, I think that's not descriptive at all. I would say that real estate and precious metal, any tangible asset for that matter is a real investment. And they're the oldest, most secure investments in the history of mankind. So when you look at real estate, you know, if, if you buy it and uh, you've got a tenant in it, somebody's, you know, paying, paying things, paying. If, if you've got leverage, they're going to be taking care of the debt service. You're going to have the cash flow, even if you never have that appreciation. I was taught never to bank on appreciation. And you don't have to with real estate. If you go back to metal, let's say gold, uh, what has to happen? You're still betting that it goes up in value. So, you know, I love real estate for all the reasons that are listed on this page and more. But, you know, if you look at real estate and you look at money pulled out of your pocket, you know, the bottom line is it's, it's a great deal. You buy it, you hold it. You, when it comes time to dispose of it, you can do an exchange. You get the choice of paying the tax. So when we're talking about a you know, retirement account, we've got a lot of situations where people used to, maybe there was one professional in the, in the retirement world that used to say, well, why would you do an exchange when you could just use an IRA for this? They're apples and oranges, two totally different things. Now, with that said, we can actually combine an IRA investment and a 1031 investment into a common asset. So uh, they are not mutually exclusive. So we can blur lines back and forth. And, and once again, if you've got an idea, you've got a question, please don't hesitate to reach out. So what's a mystery? What's a big deal with a self-directed IRA? Since we're talking about solving problems with retirement accounts, typically the, 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 the root of this solution is going to be an IRA or maybe it's a 401k plan. And, and with, this, uh, you know, with this COVID situation, uh, we've got the CARE Act, which actually gave you some access to 401k funds. You, you know, you can take up to 100k for three years, and and you know that's something that's that's unusual, right? To be able to have access to money just to take care of situations. Now, I, I really think it's sort of a trap because what's going to happen with 100k? It's going to come out, you're going to spend it, and then you're going to be treated. It's going to be gone, and you're going to have a tax consequence. If it's not put back in in that timeline, it's going to be treated as distribution trigger tax consequences for you. So if you're going to do that, please be careful. Please set aside the tax consequence. At least keep it safe so that you're not having to come out of pocket three years from now when that thing has to be taken care of. But if we look at you know the base of this whole process, you know, a self-directed IRA is not a legally defined term. It's just a term that describes an account that allows you to go do what you want to do. And in the most basic sense, all we're doing is moving funds from a custodian that won't allow you to do what you want to do to one that does. So, and, and you know, obviously what you want to do is within some limits, but you know, that's really what we're talking about. If we're talking about 401k plans, we're really looking at a 401k plan and what it currently is. If you've got a 401k plan and you want to go do something that, that, that is not offered within that plan, well, I shouldn't say that, uh, but maybe the plan allows you to do something you've been told you can't. I've had many, many transactions through the years where I've been told 
by the taxpayer who was told by their trustee or administrator on the 401k plan they couldn't do something. And when I got the plan and reviewed the plan, I found that they could. And then even at that point, I had to argue with the administrator or trustee about what was possible. So never really go you know, on face value of somebody's comment, take a look at what you've got. Now, if the 401k plan does not allow you to do what you wanna do, First question, can we amend the plan to allow it? If we can't amend the plan to allow it, we replace the plan. But you know, once again, in this situation, uh, we've got some relief there. And, and you know, you've got the ability, once again, if, if we look back to the last collapse, we have lots of people losing their jobs. Now, you know, that's a horrible thing. And, and you know, nobody's gonna say it's not. But if we look at the, 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 you know, the, the, the silver lining of the whole thing, you now have access to the 401k plan. So when we're looking at creative self-directed account, any IRA can be self-directed. We're looking at 401k plans. We've got a situation where, uh, well, any corporate sponsored plan, you can't get access to money in a normal period of time until uh, you're 59 and a half years old. You can take an in-service distribution, or if it's a previous employer plan, we can use that money. But you know, we've had people, to show the extreme of this situation, we've actually had people quit their jobs to get access to money when they were needing to. And, and I'll tell you how crazy it actually is. We, we've got people that, that uh, have actually gone to the extreme of getting divorced. And part of the divorce decree was splitting up that 401k asset, which gave them access. So you know, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, you know, this is a situation where if you've lost your job, that uh, 401k plan can be rolled into self-direct IRA, can be put, you know, let's say we could even do a rollover business startup for you. So during that last crash, we did a lot of those, got people into a situation where maybe they'd always dreamed of having their own business, never had had it, and they hadn't had the money, but that 401k plan now provides the source of funds to go create a new life. So we will talk further about that in a little while. So once again, we look at, self-directed retirement accounts, a 401k plan, current employer plan. If you're under 59 and a half, you're pretty much stuck in there unless you want to quit or get divorced. Um, but, uh, you know, all joking aside, that's that's the reality of it. If uh, you've been laid off and, and you're now without a job and you have a 401k plan, we can move that plan into either a, a for new solo 401k plan if you're going to start a business or we could do a rollover business startup which literally allows you to create a business and work for it so we've got options there and uh, give us a call we'll be happy to go over all those options and fit the process and the vehicle to your scenario so why do it today we've pretty much talked about this page already. Maybe it's a situation where it's the life raft to your future. Maybe you're quitting or changing jobs. Or you've been laid off. You've got access to that money, uh, and that's going to be the change. So really what this slide's talking about is, you know, the opportunity today is you've got a situation where lots of people are sitting at home trying to figure out what they're going to do going forward, and this might be a solution to give you that opportunity. To go do what you want to do. When we look at a retirement account, we really look at two basic things. If I'm talking about an exchange, for those of you in the audience that do tax deferred exchanges, I like simple. So I break it down into four basic you know, situations with a, an exchange. One, it's gotta be an exchange. Two, what's given received have to be of like kind. Three, you need to go across or up in value and equity. And finally, we've gotta have continuity vesting. Now, in a retirement account, we've only got two real issues. One, what do you want to invest in? And two, who are you transacting between or for the benefit of? So the way the law works in retirement accounts, if it's not specifically prohibited, it's therefore allowed. A, a, an IRA can literally buy anything other than collectibles, life insurance contracts, or stock in a sub S corporation. 401k plans, the only limitation is collectibles. So it's really broad that way. So rarely is an investment a problem. What triggers problems typically for people is transactions between or for the benefit of a disqualified party. So your next question is, well, who's a disqualified party to a plan? Well, if it's your plan, you are. Uh, it, let's say you have a traditional and a Roth. Well, each of those plans would be disqualified parties to one another. Uh, your spouse is a disqualified party to your plan. Parents, grandparents, kids, 
grandkids, their spouses, or any legal entity owned in a controlling interest by one of those. Those are all considered disqualified parties. And uh, you know, any, any transaction that benefited one of those would be considered a prohibited transaction, all right? Now, what's interesting is you can't transact between or for the benefit of disqualified party, but you can transact along with one. So what do I mean by that? Now, let's say you want more money to go buy an asset. Well, you can take your retirement account and it can be an owner and you can be a co-owner of that asset, whether it's property or whatever other investment it might be. Now, if we're talking about real estate investments, you could be either a Tennessee and common owner or you could be a, a common member of an LLC. So if we're looking at this joint ownership with your IRA in a, a real estate transaction, you know, think about it this way. There's never a perfect way to do things. So I, you know, I like uh, the LLC structure for owning real estate. If we contain, uh, if that LLC has as its members, let's say if we're talking in the IRA space, the trust company for benefit of your IRA, we could have an LLC that has that trust company for benefit of your IRA as a member, and you could be personally not a, a member of that LLC as well. Now that structure is nice because just the, the LLC is then going to make every investment, everything just goes in and out of that LLC account. The downside of that structure is that at the end of the day, you personally are gonna have tax exposure on disposition. If it's a non leverage investment, uh, your retirement account won't. So you personally might want to do an exchange where the retirement account doesn't need to. And in, in that scenario, we'd have to do an exchange for the LLC, which may or may not be what you want to do. And it also keeps the money going forward together. The other problem with the LLC structure is that once we create that limited liability and come, you know, let's say fund that limited liability with funds from both you personally and the other side, we've got a situation where we are having, uh, sorry, I got distracted a little bit that said low bandwidth. I hope nobody's seeing a jerky, uh, jerky image out there. But if, if we're looking at a situation where it's Tennessee and common, I like it because the LLC structure, after the initial investment in the LLC by the two disqualified parties, we cannot have additional money come in. So let's say you wanna make an additional contribution to that LLC via, you personally or the uh, retirement account, any future transaction with that LLC would be considered a prohibited transaction. So we've really got that entity after it's been the initial funding, it's a static entity. The tenancy and common structure allows uh, you one, the ability upon disposition for you personally to do an exchange. And once again, the retirement account doesn't need to, but two, it allows you to have more money go into a transaction because anybody out there that's got investment properties understands once in a while things happen. Maybe a tenant beats up a property. Maybe you've got a, you know, a disaster, you know, some hailstorm goes and blows out your roofs and now you've got a need for a whole bunch of money there. And you know, how do you fix that? So you know, I, I guess the alternate, if we've got an LLC, we'd have to create another limited liability company and have money thrown in that way, but everything gets complicated. And I just think that that tenancy and common structure is very nice because once again, it allows joint ownership, the tenancy and common, you need to have a tick agreement, tenancy and common agreement, spelling out how that property is going to work. And that tick agreement needs to be IRA specific, IRA 401k specific. But that would also allow upon disposition, you personally to do an exchange and the retirement account can do whatever it wants to do. But the big thing here, once again, is to state that you can have joint ownership of a property or some other investment. And it's just a question of how you want to structure that, what's going to work best in your scenario. But on the bright side, you can definitely do it. So we talked about investing together and we talked about the ability to do something called that rollover business startup. So the rollover business startup, we, we can use for real estate investment. We put real estate investment companies together using the structure. We've done everything from uh, mining operations, gold, silver, palladium mine. We've done Alaskan fishing operations. We've done car dealerships, mattress companies, lots of real estate investment companies. But the rollover business startup process allows you literally to create a new company that you're employed by using your retirement funds. And, and what happens is we are going to move 
the funds into a, we're going to create a new 401k plan. We're going to create a new C corporation. Your retirement mo money moves into the new 401k plan. It's sort of chicken or egg deal. It's sort of a funny situation, but uh, you know, how's the plan exist without the corp and how's the corp exist without the plan? But the uh, plan gets funded. The plan then makes the investment, in the corporation, we require our client, our taxpayer to put in 5%. We do that for a variety of reasons. If you're interested in doing this, you can give us a call. We'll go through that. But once again, we'd like to see at least a 5% interest in this thing. And the balance of the funds can be your retirement account. The plan, the move, money moves into the plan. The plan buys the corp. The corp then buys the business. If we're talking real estate, you've just got a C corporation that's making the investments. You're working as an employee of that corporation. You, you've just got a life raft to the future. So you know that's that's an extreme example going to the real estate situation, but you know we can we can let, let's say you've got a business and and you've got a major problem there. This is intended to be a you know a business startup situation. We can't just take your money and put it into your existing business, but we could create a new one. So let's say you've got a business, it needs help, and the only source of funds you've got access to is your retirement account. We just have to create a new C corporation. You personally would contribute the business. You need to have an appraisal of the business, get a good valuation of it so that it's defendable, so nobody's gonna attack you on it. And uh, so you're gonna contribute to that business, receive a, a shares attributable to the value of that business. And then simultaneously, the retirement accounts making the investment that new co, the new corporation. And now there you go. You've got the funds, you've got access to it. So, you know, never say die. Look at the situation and, uh, you know, ask the questions. But this situation really works well for people. They're looking for a place to go. The franchise world understands this. They'll even talk about some of the banks uh, understand what's going on and they'll actually give you SBA loans in addition to this stuff. But uh, you know, just keep in mind the rollover business start startup is a great solution for people that are in dire straits, or maybe somebody that's just looking for that opportunity to go forward in a brighter future. They've always looked at that opportunity to get a business and, and they finally have this opportunity. So it's a silver lining if you've got access to a 401k plan that you didn't think you'd have access to until you're 59 and a half. We've got a, a, a few different solutions here we're gonna talk about, and they're gonna be uh, you know, things that, these actually have been done. They're not hypothetical situations. Um, I, well, I say that, and then I guess actually the, the CARES Act thing is, is going to, is sort of a hypothetical because we, we haven't, uh, we're just getting started with it. But uh, you know, the idea is we've got a, situation and, and and this slide does talk about something we have done for many many years when we do a reverse exchange you know the, the biggest issue with a reverse exchange is do you have the money to go buy something do you have the money to make this purchase happen before you have the proceeds from that sale going forward and and uh, we've had lots of people through the years that we've got something in the retirement world called a 60 day rollover. If, if you've got uh, retirement funds, you can do that once a year. And so we've had situations where we self directed retirement accounts for people, and then they call us up, they're wanting to do a reverse exchange, and they're asking for different you know, sources of funds. Well, a lot of times we'll, we'll just say, okay, let's, let's get access to that money. Uh, take that 60 day rollover, you go buy the property. When your property sells, the money comes back in. You obviously only have a 60 day timeline. So you know, my advice, anytime we're looking at reverse exchange is, I, I guess, don't do it if you don't have to. So I, I really encourage people to ask for the time they need. And if we, if we run out of that time, whether it's time on the acquisition or time on the disposition, whatever property is, is being acquired, if a property is being acquired first, I ask for whatever period of time you can to make that purchase happen. If we're looking at a situation where, you know, we've got both properties in the market, the sale property happens right away, you don't know where you're going, you know, ask for the time once again. But if we've got this rollover, that 60 day rollover, you only have the 60 days. So once again, we're gonna look and ask for whatever time we, we can, and then we use that money, and then we get the money from that sale that comes back in, we use that, the sale proceeds from the uh, relinquished property to pay back that money from the 60 day rollover. So that is something that we have done many, many times. We do have the situation now with the CARE Acts where, as I mentioned earlier, you've got access to a lot more money 
uh, for up to three years. But you know, once again, make sure you have access to the funds needed to pay the tax consequence if that money stays out of the transaction. Okay. So, you know, we got to be careful anytime we've got money that's coming out, make sure you're going to have a situation where you can get it in without a problem. And uh, that, that obviously can be problematic. We like to say we talk about opportunities and solutions in here. And uh, this is one of those, this is something that was done the last crash. So, you know, we, we're in a situation where think about what land costs today. I mean, if we're looking at, you're, you know, looking at me, I'm sitting in Portland. Well, you know, pre-crash anyway, if we go back, a, you know, that short period of time, you know, we had uh, downtown property that just a couple of years ago might have been $250,000. Now it's $500,000 for a piece of dirt. And, you know, if we're talking people in New York or San Francisco or LA or Seattle, you're probably saying, well, that's nothing. And, and maybe it isn't, but you know, that might have gone down. Well, this this situation was was actually in Bend. Bend's a you know wonderful, beautiful place to live and and just to be. There's so much going on out there, very active people, just a great lifestyle. Well, it, it, since it's such a wonderful place, values go high. And then when we have a crash, they go low because it's a lot of second homes. That, you know, it's it's vacation type property, a lot of it, but it's a wonderful place. So we got contacted during the last crash uh, by a developer, builder developer that saw the opportunity to go buy, you know, land dirt cheap, literally dirt cheap. So you, you look at a situation where there were there was lots over there that were selling for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars pre-crash, and they couldn't be given away at seventy thousand dollars. So we had had builders say, "Gee, you know, I, I want to buy this stuff, but I have no idea when we're going to get out of this." And I think that's what we're sort of sitting looking at today. Will we have a V recovery, U recovery? How long is it going to happen? You know, what 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 is going to happen when people go back to work? And you know, what is happening with the financing? What's going to happen with those values? You know, how how do we move forward? And in this situation, this gentleman said, "Hey, you know, I, I want to buy this land. I have no idea when I'm going to get started. I can't afford to pay the banks the carrying costs. You know, the insurance or not the insurance, but the interest to go forward for who knows how long." could I use my retirement account and, and use it as a land bank? And the answer is certainly yes. And so what we did in this situation, we did a checkbook IRA for them. And in a checkbook IRA, once again, is we're gonna create new custodial account with a, a trust company that allows self-directed investments. We then create an IRA specific limited liability company. The investment that the trust company makes is in the limited liability company. This is once again called a checkbook IRA or an IRA LLC. So as soon as the trust company has made this investment, and this is a manager managed limited liability company, the member, you know, legally speaking, is going to, you know, read ABC trust company, CFBO custodian for benefit of, IRA number, you know, whatever it might be. And that's going to be the member. It could be multiple accounts. It could be your IRA, it could be yours and a spouse's, you know, it could be any, it could be your traditional and Roth, it could be any number of things. Uh, but you know, when we, we do that thing, the investment the trust company makes is in the LLC. The LLC has as its manager, you the taxpayer. So you have the power of the pen to go forward. To buy a property, you're just simply making an investment in the LLC's name and uh, you need earnest money, negotiate from inception in the LLC's name, write check for the earnest money, write check for the down payment, get that thing closed. But in this situation, the gentleman took the checkbook IRA, bought that land. Now, you know, that's great. That works well. The situation, though, is, is he later wanted to be able to build on it. You know, his, he wants to be able to develop this stuff. And if, if he were then to build on that property or develop it and, and he wants to you know, do that work, can he do that? No, that would be a prohibited transaction. So what we did is we created a second limited liability company and we reduced his ownership of that entity down to one sixth owner. So if you remember back probably 15 minutes ago, I was talking about disqualified parties and I mentioned uh, any entity that was owned in the controlling interest by a disqualified party would also constitute a, a disqualified entity and therefore a prohibited transaction. By squeezing them down this one sixth interest, we no longer have a prohibited transaction to have this, uh, this, this occur. 
And so that's what we did. We created the checkbook IRA LLC. We created a second LLC. His ownership of the second LLC was, that was the development entity. And he was the one six owner. So it therefore no longer constituted a prohibited transaction. And he was able to build on those lots when it came time to build on them. So imagine you're in an exchange and you want to go forward. Well, and, and what's happening to loans these days? You might have a reduction in loan to value. Something I want to comment on is, is one of the big fallacies of 1031. And when we're talking about value and equity requirements to go forward in an exchange, you're going to hear lots of people say you have to replace debt in an exchange. And that's entirely untrue. Debt can be reduced in two ways. One, by going down in value, and that triggers tax because you went down in value. The other way debt is reduced is by adding cash. So imagine, think back on the last recession. If you were in real estate, what happened to those loans? You had an increase in, in what was required to get it. You had a decrease in, in, in loan to value. And, and think about what was happening to exchangers in that same period of time. Their properties were reducing in value and, and therefore reducing in the equity in that thing. So, you know, it was, a, it was really a recipe for disaster. And we had people contacting us, hey, do I need to pay off the property predisposition so I don't have to have debt on the replacement? And that's entirely unnecessary. So once again, you can always add cash to a transaction without tax exposure. So, but you cannot you know, go down in value without tax exposure. Simple rule to remember is you can offset mortgage boot with additional cash. You cannot offset cash boot with additional mortgage. Just think of it this way. The government never has a problem with you adding money. They just don't want to see you pull it out without tax. And remember this, it doesn't matter what you put into it. You think you're entitled to it. The first money out is going to be old Uncle Sam's. So in this scenario, uh, this is a transaction we worked on, uh, you know, once again, back in the last crash. And we had a gentleman that gave up a, a large multifamily project, wanted to buy a, actually a, a new restaurant. And he was needing more money. It was a bigger deal. So what we did, 1031 prohibits uh, the exchange of a partnership interest. So when we're looking at members, of an LLC, if, if we have a multi-member LLC, that's not something that can, can the entity can do in exchange, but you couldn't take your personal interest out of a, a multi-member LLC and do an exchange. Now there's something called a drop and swap or a swap and drop. Once again, that's another, uh, another situation, another seminar you're gonna have to sign up for. But uh, you know that's one of our biggest, if we look at any exchange, time's the biggest issue, vesting's the second biggest. And the vesting issue is simply because of, of you know, different ownership and, and structure. So if we look at a 1031, since it prohibits partnership interests, what it requires, if we're gonna combine your IRA or 401k funds into the buy side of a 1031, it's gonna require a tenancy in common structure. So again, I'm gonna stress that you should have a tenancy in common agreement, and that tenancy in common agreement should have IRA specific, IRA 401k specific uh, verbiage in it. But you know, I like that structure. It's gonna allow us to get the exchange done, and then the future upon disposition, it's gonna allow each, uh, you personally and your plan money to go do what you wanna do with each of those separately as you choose. But once again, it's, it's not a problem at all to transact along with a disqualified party. It's a problem to transact between or for the benefit of a disqualified party. So this, this, uh, this slide, solution number four, this is another one that was uh, the last crash. And you know, think about that situation. What we're not seeing yet, and hopefully we won't see, is is you know a, a continued meltdown and and banks closing and everything else. I really, you know, a lot of the the regional banks, the banks we love, uh, you know, went away in that last crash, and and uh, you know, which hurt us because you know I, when, when we're looking at reverse exchanges, improvement exchanges, those type of transactions, typically the regional banks are the ones that you know, a portfolio lender, somebody that's going to make those loans and help our people get where they want to go. And in this situation, if we go back, this builder developer had some land. The objective of that investment in land was to ultimately build a, a multifamily project, a nice 
nice one. And, and uh, unfortunately, the downturn happened, crash happened. The builder developer was falling behind. And the biggest problem in this particular scenario was not only was the builder developer falling behind, but the bank itself was failing. So if the bank failed, he was going to uh, actually lose everything. And he really didn't want to do that and, and honestly couldn't afford to do that. So he came to us and he said, hey, you know, dad's IRA happened to have a nice chunk of equity in it. It had, you know, maybe a million and a half in it. And, uh, you know, this gentleman had, it was about a $3 million property, a million eight in equity. And uh, so he had that debt on it, about a million too. So dad's IRA clearly had enough capital in it to take care of that problem. So what we ended up doing is, is we did a checkbook IRA or IRA LLC for dad. And if we just took dad's money to pay that property off, that would clearly constitute a prohibited transaction. So what we ended up doing is we created a second limited liability company. And just like we talked about in that earlier example, in this situation, what happened is Junior contributed the property. We need a hard value on that thing. So you have to have, you know, let's get an appraisal done. And, and Junior, you know, he, he contributed property to the limited liability company, the new limited liability company. He received a membership interest attributable to the equity in that property, the roughly 1.8 million. At the same time he contributed the property, Dad's IRA put the you know million four, million five into that LLC. Now who owns the property? It's not Junior's property anymore. The property is owned by the limited liability company that has both Dad's IRA and Junior's members. But that limited liability company owns the asset and has the cash to pay the asset off. And that's exactly what it did. So that was a situation. That's one example of many that we worked through. And ultimately, that property was developed. And it was a joint, uh, joint investment for the two. And, and uh, when it comes time to turn it, they'll turn it and they'll choose to do whatever they want to do with it. But you know, that's a, you know, a great example of a solution to take care of somebody's problem. And, and it really, really works. So we've got this last example here and it sort of balls up everything. All right. So you've got a situation where we had a, an older couple came to us and and this wasn't a hardship sort situation this was just a situation where they really wanted to you know a leg up to go forward they needed a place to live and a job i didn't know that at the initial uh, consultation with them because they simply asked hey is it possible to use both of our iras to go out and buy this mobile home rv park and, and my answer was yes yeah, certainly you can do that not a problem at all we'll just do a multi-member uh checkbook ira llc and I guess what I'd like to say at, at this point before continuing is if we're, if we're looking at that IRA LLC situation and scenario, you know, I, I talked about when we, we, we can definitely combine multiple disqualified parties into a common LLC, and that's not a problem, but additional investments in the LLC by any of those disqualified parties is not okay. So if somebody comes to me and they're in their 50s or 60s maybe, and they wanna do this, we're, we're gonna do, maybe in their 40s even, we're gonna do a single LLC with both accounts as its member. Uh, if, you, you know, if you're younger, if you call me up and you're in your 20s and you wanna do that and you're married, I'm gonna do a, a checkbook IRA LLC for each one of you because I know you've got many, many years ahead of you that you're gonna be making contributions to your retirement account. You probably wanna you know, build up your checkbook IRA as well. So depending on age or what your situation is, making additional contributions, we might do a single checkbook IRA LLC for a husband and wife, or we might do multiple, and it really is just dependent upon whether additional money is coming in. A rollover business startup, we're not talking IRA at all. So what, what happened in this is we shifted the direction because their initial comment was, look, we want to go make this investment in the, in the mobile home RV park. We want to use our IRAs to do it. So that checkbook IRA LLC situation would be a perfect scenario, perfect solution for them. What ultimately happened, though, is when they told me, hey, you know, we are not in a situation where, where uh, we can just do that. We actually want to take ownership of it. We want to manage the asset. We want to be the on-site manager. So we'd like to take compensation. And we'd actually also 
uh, like to live there, which both those would constitute uh, disqualified, uh, you know, transaction, prohibited transactions with an IRA and, uh, you know, with a 401k plan as well. But by doing the rollover business startup, we actually created the new 401k plan, moved both IRAs into that plan. And just a, you know, a housekeeping note on that, if it's a beneficiary or a Roth funds, we can't move those into that 401k plan. But uh, anything else we should be able to work with. The plan bought the corp, the corp bought the park, and they had everything going their way. They got, uh, I, I just love this story because they got an investment, they got a job, and they got a place to live. So I think that's a great story and a great solution for those people. And it's definitely something that I would expect we're going to be looking at uh, going forward in different scenarios. So with that said, um, that's our last example. We're going to go through a few things. The next few pages in here are just glossary. I'm not going to cover those when you're home at night. Uh, we will be uploading, actually I apologize, I did not upload this presentation uh, into the handouts. So if you'd like a hard copy of this, please reach out to us. You can reach out to Tina at iraadvantage.net. Actually, I'm sorry, it's T. Colson, T. Colson, C-O-L-S-O-N at iraadvantage.net or admin at iraadvantage.net and we'll make sure to get you hard copies of this presentation. And uh, what, what I was gonna say is if you're having a hard time falling asleep some night, pull it out and it'll put you right to bed. But uh, the glossary is here to help and we've got a few pages of that in here. And then we're going to finish up with this IRA investors checklist. So really this sort of applies to, to both IRAs and 401k plans. If we're looking at this situation, I want to start off that first one. It says plan ahead. You know, it, it takes two to four weeks to put one of these things together. If we talk about IRAs or 401k plans, it's, it's you know, the, the deal is with a, with a Wall Street IRA or 401k, you, you really, it, it's pretty much impossible to create what, what would be considered a prohibited transaction. Uh, when you've got a truly self-directed account, and, and by the way, there's lots of you know, Wall Street firms that offer self-directed accounts, but, but it's their definition of it. It's something that's going to allow you the, the ability to buy off their menu of investment options. A truly self-directed account is one that's going to allow you to buy anything the law allows, and I think that's a big, big difference in definition, and it's something you need to be aware of. So when we're looking at different trust companies, you, you need to also understand if you're picking a trust company, how they're going to charge you. And, and I've got some feelings on that. I, I really discourage our clients from working with the trust company that's going to charge based upon the value of the account. And, and that's really important when it comes to RMDs, required minimum distributions at the end of the day. You don't want to be adverse to your trust company. You don't want to be arguing with them over what something's worth. During the last crash, we had one unfortunate investor that had a million dollar note uh, you know, with somebody and that note went south. Well, it hadn't legally gone south yet. He knew it was no good. And he ended up arguing with the trust company over the value of that. They wanted to ding him and, and say, you know, charge him based upon a million dollar value when it wasn't worth the paper it was written on. And uh, so I just, that left a real, you know, sour taste in my mouth. And I just, I really like our clients to be paying for something and they're getting what their values are, are to be. The other thing is you want to understand if you're doing a checkbook IRA, what that trust company is going to require of you. Because some trust companies require the taxpayers, tax or legal people to sign a document stating they're experts, all things IRA, which they're probably not going to want to do. Some trust companies won't allow the taxpayer to, to be the manager of that checkbook IRA LLC, which totally defeats the entire purpose of that entity, too. So those are things that, that just to keep in mind. But there's there's a bunch of uh, self direct custodians coast to coast to take care of you in this situation. But the deal is it, it takes time to put one of these things together. And and if if you call us today, it's not going to take the two to four weeks. Probably it's going to most likely take longer because everybody in that pipeline is possibly working at home or remotely someplace else. Things just are taking time to get done. And and what happens in this scenario? You might find a piece of property that you want to buy. And it's a great opportunity for you, and you want to make that offer before you've got your your investment vehicle created, whether it's a solo 401k plan 
or your IRA. So your natural reaction is, well, hey, you know, most contracts are assignable, so I'm just going to personally tie the thing up, and then I'll sign it over to my plan at a later date. Well, that's not okay. Technically, that constitutes a prohibited transaction. So the idea is, if you scuba dive, you know anybody that scuba dives has to plan the dive, then they dive the plan, right? If, you, if you're a pilot, you file a flight plan. Boats, you file a float plan. You let people know you know what's going on. You set it up in advance. When we're talking about retirement accounts, what's really interesting to me is, you know, I've been doing exchanges for you know several decades. And, and you know, I rarely have clients come in here on the exchange side. And when we talk about retirement accounts, I have people come in here all the time. I mean, obviously it's been a few weeks now since we've had people in here, but you know, on a typical day, pre-COVID, post-COVID, we have lots of people's retirement accounts come in. And, and sometimes it's somebody that we've done exchange work for for a long, long time, and I'd never seen them in the exchanges. And they come in with their retirement account. I said, well, you know, I never saw you with the exchanges. Why are you here now? I'm always happy to see everybody. And their, their response is, well, this is my retirement account. And, and this is my retirement money. And, and I really look at, you know, anybody's money is that retirement money. If we're talking 1031, it's probably getting them to the future in the same scenario. But people are more cautious with this stuff. And our position is you want to be very careful. You want to do things right from the very beginning. So, you know, one of the traps is you find a property, you want to write the offer, your account's not set up, so you tie it up personally. Most contracts are signable, so you want to assign it from you personally, the plan at a later date. And once again, that constitutes a prohibited transaction. So your next comment, well, why don't I just write it in, in the custodian's name? Well, yeah, that'd be fine. But uh, do you have the power of the pen for the custodian? The answer to that is no. So, you know, it's really important that you get things set up before you start going forward. It, it's entertaining to me because, you know, we advertise on the radio a lot. We, we've got uh, all the web stuff and I'll have a, somebody contact us. They ask me all these questions. I tell them, you know, it takes time and be ready. And when do you think I get the call? I get the call when they've got a purchase that's, that's imminent. They got to get it done. And now everything's a push. So, you know, take the time. Don't get stressed. You know, yesterday I was talking to somebody that, you know, has a, a million four coming into their retirement account. And, you know, it's it's stressful to get everything taken care of. And it's especially stressful right now when everything's, you know, a, a call and a, a phone call and a return phone call and everything else. So really be ready for this stuff. Ask the questions. Take the time to be ready. Uh, a solution to that earnest money, if you're not set to go. Uh, you know, think of this. I, I talked about disqualified parties and prohibited transactions. What I did not mention, I talked about who is a disqualified party. I didn't talk about those that are not that might truly surprise you. If we look at a related party transaction in 1031, those related parties are, you know, parents, grandparents, kids, grandkids, spouses, and, you know, entities own a controlling interest in. You know, if we're talking about retirement accounts, we're talking about disqualified parties, siblings, aunts, uncles, cousins, they are not disqualified parties. So if you're ready to make a purchase of something or write an offer on something and your account's not set and you've got a brother or sister that you get along with, let them make the offer. Let them take it, tie it up, and then they can assign it over to you later. So that's a, that's a great solution and, and that can take care of some of these time sensitive scenarios. So, um, you know, the second bullet point, so the, you know, first is the plan ahead. Second, you can, you can almost, you can almost, that's a typo. I've got a fix in there. You, you can invest in almost, you know, make almost any investment uh, with a truly uh, self-directed retirement account. It, it's, it's really wide open. You can purchase with family members and friends. You cannot purchase for them or from them. You can't loan to or borrow from a disqualified party. You can't buy from or sell to, you know, we always talk about, uh, you know, buying a property to retire in, that's entirely possible. You just can't use that property, nor could any other disqualified pro party use that property until it's taken as a, a distribution. And I take, I mean that fully taken as a distribution. And, and, and while we're talking about taking in-kind distributions, I think one of the things that comes up is, is uh, one of the objections I hear all the time is, well, what happens since real estate quote unquote, is not liquid, what happens if you use your retirement account to go buy that property and now you're in a situation where you've got to take an RMD, a required minimum distribution, you don't have any cash to take it. 
Well, an easy solution is to simply take pieces of that property as a distribution. Or if it's a checkbook IRA, you can just assign membership, membership interests in that entity. And if you do that over a series of years, if you distribute that asset using distributions of a minority interest each time, you can actually, you got two benefits. One, what's it worth? Two, you can actually discount the value of that if it's a minority interest, you don't have a controlling interest in the asset, you can actually discount the value of that percentage substantially. Talk to your tax and legal people about that, but that in-kind distribution can actually offer a tremendous opportunity, people, it's not a problem. Now, with everything that's good is bad, you have a situation where you take an in-kind distribution, you're going to be incurring a tax liability without receiving the cash to pay the tax obligation. So where's an easy solution to get that money? Easy solution to get that money is after you've taken the last distribution uh, and before the taxes are due, do a cash out refinance of the property. You now own the property, the refi money has paid the tax obligation and there you go. So whether we're talking about an investment that you love, and like to personally own, or we're talking about an investment that is going to ultimately become your retirement home. Either way, you've got a situation where you can take that entire property in a single distribution, or you can take pieces of it over time. You know, either way works, whether it's tick or that membership interest situation. All right. Um, <clears throat> I guess one other scenario we've got, and, and I'm gonna hit your Q and A's, is, is that you know, I, I wanna just mention, we're really at the end of this presentation, is that one of the big, another fallacy in the retirement world is you can't leverage an investment with an IRA, totally untrue. It's just gotta be non-recourse IRA 401k compliant debt. And I guess uh, you know, one, one of the little tips I've gotta give you there is if we're talking a leveraged investment using an IRA, just be aware it's not a reason to do or not to do a, a given investment. Just be aware that any income or gain attributable to the leverage is going to trigger some tax exposure. So income and gain attributable to the equity is tax, uh, tax deferred or with the income and gain attributable to leverage, that's going to have tax exposure. Now, what's, what's interesting is a 401k plan that does not apply. So if we're talking a real estate broker, putting a plan together for a broker, I'm always going to do a solo 401k if they don't have full-time employees, because that alone, that, that situation where you've got the tax on leverage does not apply to the 401k where it does with the IRA. So as we said earlier, negotiate from the deal's inception, the IRA or IRA LLC's name. Do not overextend, plan on keeping nice cushions so you've got things to go forward. At this point, if anyone's got any questions, please text them uh, in there on that panel to your right. And uh, otherwise, we are at the end of the presentation. I'd like to mention that we've got our YouTube channels that are there to uh, give you some Corona content. Hopefully they'll take care of uh, some situations or maybe they'll be that sleep medicine for you. But you can type in equity advantage, uh, 1031 exchanges, IRA advantage, self-directed IRAs. Another thing I wanna mention, if you're looking for a place uh, to get more exposure for your properties, for years we had people sending us property information, wanting to get it out to our clients. We don't do that, but we've got our post1031.com website. It's there to take care of those needs. And, uh, more than anything, there's nothing other, you know, the only dumb question is one you don't ask. So if you got questions, concerns, you or clients have problems with transactions that are occurring right now, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out. And if you're a broker, one last time, please get us your contact information if you're looking for CE for this presentation. Thank you very much for the time today. And if you've got a topic that you'd like information on or a presentation on, please don't hesitate to reach out. And you can reach out to just info at 1031 exchange or info at iraadvantage.net. Best of health to everyone. Hope you found this helpful and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you very much and uh, take care. Bye-bye.